If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech And more importantly, does a community have any say at all in what kind of, uh, of businesses come into it and become a part of it? And what kind of demands should a community be able to make on a business to become a good member of that community? Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on a true democracy with an end to corporate domination. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guests today are Stephen Bitliff and Jerry uh, Gary uh, Jelnak. Uh, both are with a new organization here in the Portland metro area called Tigard First. Tigard is a suburban community just south of Portland. The stated purpose of Tigard First is to bring accountability, transparency, and debate to the issues impacting local residents. So welcome to the show, Steve and Gary. Thank you very much. Great. Good. Good. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about Tigard First. Uh, what's the reason for having formed the organization? Tiger First, it's uh, in its second round. Uh, in uh, 2006, there was a Tiger First formed, and its uh, specific purpose was to stop uh, or prevent a Walmart from uh, becoming a part of the community of Tiger. And I was a part of that, and it turns out that uh, we thought we were successful. Uh, this past June, I picked up a newspaper, local newspaper, and uh, found an announcement that said that uh, Tigard was welcoming a new tiger to the area. So lo and behold, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Was, what was welcoming a new tiger to the area? I'm sorry, a new Walmart, excuse me. A new Walmart me. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Good. A new Walmart to the uh -huh. area. And, uh, which you thought had been defeated already. Def what I, which I thought what had been defeated already. So I, uh, I went online, uh, I looked for information. Uh, to see what exactly was happening and uh, that's when I met Steve and a small group that Steve has been working with uh, to prevent uh, this Walmart push forward uh, from happening. So um, what we have is a situation that uh, many communities in the Northwest are facing today and that is Walmart coming into their communities and uh, the reason that uh, we are um, uh, interested in preventing this from happening uh, is that, uh, as, as you're aware, uh, Walmart has a history of uh, low wages paid, no benefits to its employees, and uh, driving local businesses out of business. Mm -hmm. We find this to be rather detrimental. And so we, uh, Steve has it's, worked with, yes. It's, it's detrimental to who? And who is it not detrimental to? Well, it's it's detrimental to the uh, community interest from the perspective of uh, lower wages being paid to those employed in the community. But in addition to that, uh, it's detrimental to small businesses who have been in business for many years, provide services to the community uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. And uh, there's been a history of uh, Walmart uh, essentially causing these businesses to go out of business. Mm -hmm. And David, I, I just want to say that um, Gary's experience was, was quite typical. Uh, in April, a majority of, of the members of our group uh, got together to form a group called No Walmart in Tigard. And that was largely because through word of mouth and a lot of hearsay, uh, most of us who were residents of Tiger discovered that there is a Walmart going in this site in the Tiger Triangle. Um, and there haven't been any hearings since 2010. Uh, the city still to this day refuses to have a hearing on this issue. Uh, and in doing this, in organizing and in, in getting people together, we did a lot of outreach at farmers markets and at other public spaces. Um, and time and time again, people would come up to us ask if it was true that there was going to be a Walmart, ask if there was anything we could do to stop it. And then we talked about a lot of the issues uh, that you were alluding to. Um, how is Walmart detrimental? And more importantly, does a community have any say at all in what kind of, uh, of businesses come into it and become a part of it? And what kind of demands should a community be able to make 
on a business to become a good member of that community? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a good member of that community? Mm -hmm. So all of those things, all of those experiences, including what Gary had described, led us to do a lot of thinking about what's wrong with our city government and what's wrong with our regional government. Um, how is it that we're not being heard? As I said, we, we haven't even ha been able to get a hearing. Um, we've been to uh, a few of the public comment meetings, uh, comment sessions that you can get into in a city council meeting. But that's it. Um, the, These city, are the, 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 the public comment is like when you get like three minutes or something exactly. before the meeting itself actually starts. In Tiger, you're able to make a, in Tiger a statement. Too. Right, okay. And so, you know, we have used, we've used those sessions to request a hearing. We've used those sessions to request that they consider some, uh, some common sense changes, uh, things like restricting a parking lot, uh, the, the hours that a parking lot can be open, things like restricting the hours that guns can be sold, things like restricting alcohol sales. Um, we've talked about a lot of those things with the city council. We've had a meeting with the mayor, gotten absolutely nowhere with it. Um, and then so as I said, that experience on the Walmart issue has led us to pull back a bit and say, why is it that this is the way it is? How is it that our city is not responsive to what appears to us to be a majority of the citizens and their concerns, not even listening really to their concerns? How does it become so tone deaf? And so that really led to the formation of this group and uh, says a lot, I think, about the kinds of issues that we'll be tackling in the future. Okay. And what we, seem, what we seem to be seeing is, uh, as we look at a bigger picture, as it unfolds, is that uh, the city leadership is uh, focused upon uh, corporate and business interests and, the, uh, and, and not on the neighborhoods. Uh, what we find is that we have lists of neighborhood improvements that, um, that are to take place at some time in the future when mm -hmm. uh, they've made the list year after year after year and and these improvements never seem to make it to the top of the list so we've got issues uh, where we uh, there are segments of the a community where sidewalks are not available for people to for children to walk to school uh, for bikers to uh, bike lanes availability uh, to to get to and from work as an example uh, these are overlooked in the interest of uh, allowing uh, businesses such as Walmart enter the community at the expense of the community. Okay. That's correct. Talk, talk, talk about this process. You said there were hearings probably in 2010. Mm -hmm. and what, were the, what was the uh, subject of those hearings and, and, and why are those hearings being used now to, to justify not having hearings on the, on the current development? So very brief timeline. Um, as Gary said, uh, there was originally plans for a Walmart and it was back in 2006. Um, Walmart at the time, actually I think it was the developing company actually pulled out of that plan. Um, however, in 2008 they came back to the Tiger Planning Commission, wanted to make some changes to the plan around the facade of the building to take the Walmart specific things out and, and make it, what they said, more generic. In 2010, they came in uh, and uh, took out a recycling center. But all along, they've kept the plan essentially the same. And on that basis, they were able to basically sell this to Walmart. Walmart was able to pick up the plan, had already been approved. City says there's no need for a hearing, and the code would support that. Uh, and, and so that, has enabled Walmart basically to buy the plan already made years ago uh, and go ahead and, and go ahead with the building. Um, and unless they make any material changes, uh, significant changes, there's no requirement for them to have to go back and have a hearing. Um, and we did get into this, especially on traffic, because of the traffic impact in that area. And it's the same situation. Um, the city will not revisit the 2007 traffic study that was done. Uh, because they don't feel that there's a need. And there's no requirement for that to be redone because again, they're picking up the plan uh -huh. and using it. Okay, yeah, and so because the plan already exists and they, they're just picking up, the, picking up the generic plan and putting their name on it, correct. the city doesn't feel like there's any requirement for them to do any public meetings. That is correct. Right, okay. That is correct. And, and so th th is that the basis for your call for 
uh, transparency in government? At the, absolutely one of them, yes. Um, as Gary alluded to, there's, there are some other things that we've been uncovering. Um, Walmart is doing about $5 million of improvements around the area. But if you look at it on a map, and you can see this on our website, um, the improvements that they're paying for are improvements to the off-ramp of Highway 217, to the off-ramp of I-5, um, another off-ramp on 217, all of which, and then some signal improvements um, to make traffic flow faster and easier into the Walmart parking lot. Right. Um, the city itself is spending almost a million dollars. They say not connected to Walmart, but the, the improvements that they're making, that million dollars, um, is right around uh, a feeder street, 72nd, um, that goes, again, feeds right into Walmart. And as Gary said, it's all coming at the expense of projects, uh, street widening projects, sidewalk projects, bike lane projects that have been going on forever. My kids, uh, I just uh, sent my daughter to college this week. And um, in the 13 years we've lived here, she was never able to walk to uh, school. She was never able to walk to uh, Fowler High School or Fowler Middle School. She was never able to walk to elementary school. And the reason for that is that there's about an eight block section of 121st Avenue, which is a very busy, heavily traveled road. There are ditches on either side, no sidewalks. The road is, there's no curb, mm -hmm. there's no bike lane. And it takes about a million five to fix that. Okay. So part of my million, I look at it as going into supporting Walmart, mm -hmm. where it should have gone into other areas of the community. Mm -hmm. And another point, uh, your listeners, I'm sure, have uh, had the adventure at one time or another of driving uh, down uh, southbound uh, through Tigard on uh, uh, 99W uh, and finding how congested it is. Uh, well, these improvements, uh, from what we can tell, are going to make the congestion much worse. So we're very concerned about this, not only for the, the local residents, but for people who are moving from, or, or traveling from uh, Portland uh, through Tigard on their way to the beaches or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, okay. Um, what, what other issues does Tigard have with regard to transparency and accountability? Uh, I would say, uh, for one thing, um, and this is not, I think, specific to Tigard, but I think a lot of the communities around the metro area uh, tend to use citizen committees, citizen volunteer committees, uh, as a way to convince themselves that they're getting citizen input. And at the same time, uh, because of the way, because of the makeup of those committees, because of the way those, community, those committees can be run, um, they, in some cases, fool the city government into thinking that that's some representative sample of the residents in the city. And in other ways, uh, sometimes they are manipulating those committees into an outcome that they want to see. Um, and again, on this issue, which was obviously contentious, we were asking for a hearing and at one point, the mayor said to me, there's no point in having a hearing when it's not going to have any outcome. Uh -huh. and, and to me, that, that told volumes. That spoke volumes because... The it, decision it, is already made. And, it, it and the matter. city has specifically said, the city managers and, and, and members of the city council have specifically actually used those very words, it's a done deal, on numerous occasions. Mm -hmm. Which, again, I think is very insensitive to people that uh, are upset about this and want to talk about it. So, so the, it is a done deal. Uh, the Walmart is under construction. It is going to, it's going to open next year. There's no question about that. So the question arises, well, now what? So what we're looking at at this point is uh, something that uh, is really an offspring of, of what we saw in Washington, D.C., and the, and the attempt uh, to push through a living wage for these big box uh, businesses. And uh, we don't think there's any chance in the world that the sitting council in Tigard is going to allow for that. So we are preparing to put together a petition drive and push forward an initiative, mm -hmm. a vote among the people, with regard to the concept of a living wage in our community. 
and we feel that this is something of uh, great uh, importance not only to our community but to set an example for other communities as to just what can be done. And we, pretty, we feel pretty optimistic over the fact that we can gather the necessary signatures, get this on the ballot, show people through the organization we're calling Tigered First that this is absolutely a necessity for us as a, to be a healthy community going forward. Okay. Okay, so petition drive. And uh, is the petition written? Are you gathering signatures on it yet, or what is the? In the summertime, we uh, we did at the, the the previous group. We did draft uh, a uh, a sample initiative measure, uh, and we did float that around, and in fact sent that to members of the city council and tried to talk about it. Tried to talk to the mayor about it, um, and we talked about sp specific parts of that and that at the time that initiative uh, measure was uh, was modeled after several others that have successfully passed city councils across the country um, Brattleboro Vermont um, Santa Clara uh, California um, uh, there was one in Chicago uh, and incidentally Gary was mentioning the one from the uh, from the uh, City Council of Washington DC uh, and what we had proposed was very, very similar to, to that one. Um, so we're looking at something uh, similar to that, although we haven't, uh, we haven't settled on the final language yet, mm -hmm. but uh, it'll be something very mm -hmm. similar. Okay, and does the, does the city have the ability to impose a, a living wage? Yes, uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, when we did make our proposal for that, that draft initiative, um, one of the city council members requested the city attorney to draft uh, an analysis of what powers the city council had. Uh, and in, um, it was either late May or early June, the city attorney did report on that. Uh, and his memo said, yes, indeed, uh, the city does have, uh, under certain uh, parameters, the city does have the authority to make all kinds of the uh, restrictions and regulations that we've been talking about, including the living wage ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and do they have the ability to single out a particular business? That is something that a city cannot do. Um, however, uh, restrictions based on square footage, on the amount of revenue in a year, um, things like that can be done. You can't single out a specific business. Oh, okay. Or you can't. So you can say that a, a business which makes, you know, ten million dollars in revenue in a year has to have meet these certain specific requirements. Correct. In Any fact, business that met that. Yeah, correct. Okay. Ours, ours, mm -hmm. ours, our draft was uh, over a billion dollars in revenue, um, greater than uh, 85,000 square feet, and uh, uh, less than 40% of the floor space devoted to groceries. Mm -hmm. So it was primarily retail and, uh, and this much revenue mm -hmm. and this big of a store. Um, and so, uh, and, but you know, that definition, by the way, does uh, does encompass more than a Walmart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the city uh, council itself could have put these rules into effect. Yes, correct. Okay. And, and they didn't. They have refused. But of course, if they had done that, they would have had had they would have wanted to have uh, public comment. That's correct. All right. Okay. Which again, uh, you know, even if if they had had a hearing, a public comment, and not and, and voted on and voted not to do something, mm -hmm. that would have been better than the situation that we're in today. Mm -hmm. And we have good neighbor uh, big box uh, corporate uh, retailers in town in Tigard, and we've uh, we've taken a look at what their starting wages are, and they are significantly above the Oregon minimum wage. They're living wages. And therefore, we are conscious, although it won't be part of the petition, but we're conscious going in uh, that, uh, and, and we're careful not to be uh, causing uh, uh, problems for those retailers. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Um, I know that both of you have been involved in other uh, activities uh, as activists and movers and Maybe not movers and shakers, but, <laughs> but well, would you would you talk about your activities with uh, Mattis Hell Doctors for a oh, minute? Oh, I'll be happy to. Yes, um, Mattis Hell Doctors, an organization that I uh, uh, co-created uh, several years ago, 
Uh, the whole idea was uh, for the doctors locally to the Port greater Portland area, but also all of the state of Oregon, Washington State, and some of California. We banded together, put together a, a group of physicians supporting Medicare for All in the United States. And uh, this, uh, so uh, the, the group, uh, uh, we, we did a, a road uh, caravan uh, from here to uh, Washington, D.C., met with congressmen, on the, on the way there, we met in uh, 20, I think it was 27 uh, cities and, and uh, spoke before various uh, groups um, on the subject. And um, Mattis Health Doctors is still, in, uh, is still going strong. It is, okay. It absolutely Good. is. Um, and, uh, you know, we stand ready, uh, if necessary, to, to present the concept of uh, Medicare for All at a future date. Great, great. And I know, Steve, that you've been involved with uh, Move to Amend. Yes. Uh, talk, talk about that for a minute. Uh, so I, I've, been, I've been affiliated with, with various advocacy organizations or advocacy, or advocacy groups over the uh, past few years. Um, but uh, perhaps the biggest is addressing um, uh, campaign finance reform, uh, the influence of money in our political process. Um, and primarily those efforts have been uh, with a group called Move to Amend, um, and a statewide coalition, uh, which um, which we had formed over the last year and a half, and um, and we've seen some successes as of late, and mm -hmm. uh, and looking looking to do some more. Um, and I have to say that uh, the work that with Tiger First has been um, both an offshoot, or a, not an offshoot, but a uh, uh, a progression of some of the uh, some of the things that that I've learned in that in the course of those activities, um, as well as as a you know kind of an extension or application reapplication of some of the things mm -hmm. that, that we have done, so uh, so it's been it's been fun. Great. Okay. And, and what what do you see as the connection between those activities and Tigered First? I think, I think the point that we want to make is, look, we want to, we want to get uh, the community activated. We want to have them come to uh, Tigard First with their ideas. Uh, we may have a few ideas, but there's so much more going on there. We want to learn. We want people to join our group. We want to become an, a group that will have an impact upon the future of our community. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the things that, that I've learned um, in, in some of the issues, especially in, lo in dealing with uh, local governments, local city councils, mayors, um, and city staff, is that uh, for a variety of reasons, the average person feels disconnected from their own government. The government that's supposed to be closest to them, the government that is supposed to um, represent them, um, directly represent them, um, people feel less empowered now than perhaps they ever have uh, and and they don't know how to engage with it and at the same time uh, what I've seen in in city governments including Tigers is in some cases they're trying to engage but they don't know how mm -hmm. in a lot of cases they're just paying lip service to the engagement and outreach efforts that they're doing because they don't really want to hear what people think. They want to do what they want to do. And so uh, if we're successful at all, um, I hope that we can bridge that gap and that we can get people to feel connected to, to get active again in local uh, issues and mm -hmm. local politics and take control of our communities. Um, because if we can't do it at the local level, at the smallest level, um, we're really in trouble. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And so we're almost we're almost done. I did uh, you know, when you were st uh, Steve uh, speaking earlier about these uh, you know city sponsored citizen committees. It occurred to me that uh, of course they're not asking the big question. They're not asking those citizen committees to ask, "Do you want to do this at all?" <coughs> they're asking, "How should we implement this decision that has already been made?" Correct. For instance, right. there is one in Tiger for the area around where the Walmart is going to be. And it is um, a, a citizens' committee to come up with the plan. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you've been to that area, but there's already a lot of retail. There's already, I mean, and they're already building Walmart. The plan's pretty much set. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like the reason for that committee is really to put a, a, a citizen rubber stamp on what's already been in, in play. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you are a citizen and you want to come in there, you can't make substantive changes because 
traffic patterns are already established, retail is already established, mm -hmm. zoning's already established. I don't know what you would change. Right, right, yeah. And unfortunately, our time is up, so I want to thank you, Gary, for thank being here. Thank you so much, Dave. Okay, Steve, thank you. Thank you, David. All right, good. So our guests today have been Stephen Bitliff and Gary Jelnak, both with Tigered First. More information about Tigered First is available uh, on their website at tigeredfirst.org or on their Facebook uh, page at facebook.com slash tigeredfirst. Join the Alliance for Democracy for our screening of A Fierce Green Fire, The Battle for a Living Planet, narrated by Robert Redford, Ashley Judd, Van Jones, and others. This documentary is a first big picture exploration of the environmental movement spanning 50 years from conservation to climate change, from halting dams in the Grand Canyon to battling 20,000 tons of toxic waste at Love Canal from Greenpeace saving whales to rubber tappers saving the Amazon. This film tells vivid stories of, pe of people fighting and succeeding against enormous odds. This Alliance for Democracy sponsored screening will be at the First Unitarian Church in Portland, located at Southwest 12th and Salmon, starting at 6.30 on Sunday, November 10th. If you want to experience a full range of emotions and be motivated to act for the environment, this is the movie to see. And we will be joined afterwards by the director, Mark Kitchett, for a discussion. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populistdialogue to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notification. If you are watching on YouTube, you can help us expand our viewership. Contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are looking for good material and will welcome the suggestion. Populous Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you to Roger Bates, Beth Kerwin, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. We want to build a movement. Wow. We really need a movement of people to offset and to get rid of the corporate influence. It's our country. We need to take it back. If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me